up in like the lost cat. Three o'clock. Uh, my name is Vicky Navratilova, and um, you may remember me from such embarrassing moments as last night's Hacker Jeopardy. <laughs> but um, now I'm here to give a talk on uh, <laughs> what? Is it still too short? Look out this wireless thing. On my shoulder? We're having trouble hearing. Speak into my lapel. <laughs> right, so, um, is that better? No. So, no? When you turn to the left, it is. Okay. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> Okay, how's that? Is that good? Oh, thank you. <laughs> is this better? Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so this talk is basically about distributed denial of service bots and how today they're all efficient and very easy to use, but they evolved from sort of two different sets of code. So you have like your IRC history and your denial of service history. Together they form what we have today. Um, which is a modern network killing robot. Um, the reason I'm interested in this is because I work for a university and most of the machines that we have that are compromised end up having one or more of these bots on them and usually find them because they start scanning out. And I also spend a lot of time on IRC, so <laughs> it's a natural thing for me to talk about when these two things come together. So what I'd like to cover first is how do you create a network killing robot? So what uh, you end up doing is you take the be the strengths of IRC scripting plus the strengths of distributed denial of service uh, tools and you bring them together. So w what this means is that you make the tools easy for lots of newbies and so on to use, which means uh, the second generation or so of DDoS tools were very hard to pronounce. They were uh, difficult to use. Some would say they were Unix-based, so you had to have some sort of prerequisite knowledge in order to be good at using them. And that really cut off a large user base of people who can attack other people. So if you open it up to the people who don't know so much about computers, <laughs> then you have much more widespread tools. Um, another way to make it easy is you automate everything. So you script everything so you don't need to know, you know stuff. You just click a button. Um, and it's also distributed over IRC which is a really great way to get it across the world, across different networks. It reduces a single point of failure. It's redundant. It's load balancing. It's all the other buzzwords you want, but in a bad way. Um, also, geeks are generally not so good at expressing themselves. <laughs> so they go on to IRC, and they can use these tools to um, express their feelings towards others. <laughs> feelings like anger, <laughs> rage, hatred, <laughs> resentment. So you get the idea. Um, so this talk is about IRC, which at Loyola we called it I repeat classes because that's what the freshmen ended up doing <laughs> once they got addicted to IRC. Um, this is a really good way to spread things because it's everywhere and it's relatively benign. People like they, they look at you funny maybe if you run it, but they don't think you're necessarily up to no good. And it's a why everyone uses it because then they can talk to their friends in other countries for free. It's also really easy to use because they have a bunch of different clients out that are that do different things, um, different GUIs and so on. Um, you have distributed denial of service tools that, like I mentioned, go along with IRC because um, they're natural things to distribute over IRC, I guess. Oh, and also, IRC is more or less relatively static as a technology. DOS tools. As people find ways to block them, people have to put more engineering effort in to find counter, counter steps to counter the counter steps. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so early DOS attacks, back in like the beginning of the 90s or so, you first had simple things like, well, you had ping floods, which were flooding people with pings. You also had ping of death, which is like one ping packet that was really big that could crash a computer. Um, then it, 
that became, when you have ping floods, uh, <clears throat> it was mostly a matter of who had the bigger network connection was the person that was going to win. So if you were at a university and someone else was at on a dial-up connection, then of course you were going to win. So people found ways to get around that by coming up with things like Smurf attacks. And what that does is I send a ping to someone. Um, let's see if I can think. Right. <laughs> Basically, I send a <clears throat> ping <clears throat> with a faked return address, which is a broadcast address. And so um, you, well, the end result is you have one packet that's sent out, and you get a couple hundred responses in return. So that was a way to get around the my bandwidth is not as big as yours problem. Um, eventually, you had things like SIN floods, which were even smarter about using a small amount of packets to take people off the network because they would um, just basically overload the machine with a bunch of open connections, which like pretend your machine it has a switchboard for like a, you know, phone operators. They answer the phones. It's like they it's, uh, it's like one machine calling the other machine's switchboard and, and lighting up all the phones, the, uh, the switchboard operator's answering, and then nobody saying anything on the other end. That way you've tied up the resources where they're not able to accept any more incoming calls and possibly even reboot the machine or bring it to a slowdown. Eventually, the operating system writers figured out how to write network stacks that would keep that from happening. But for a while, it was an effective way to do stuff. <laughs> This is a, a cute little cartoon with Smurfs in it. Well, there's nothing much to do with Smurf attacks, but... <clears throat> so, these early tools were out in about the early 90s. Eventually, some people came up with distributed denial of service tools. Then the difference is, with the first DOS tools, you'd have one-to-one -one correlation between uh, attacker and victim. And with these, you'd have one attacker, they would control a bunch of zombies, and they would tell the zombies to attack a victim. They were pretty famous in about 1997, I think, in 1998, because they took down a bunch of famous websites like yahoo.com and ebay.com, and then they were all over the news. And then David Dietrich did a whole bunch of white papers on them, and now you know, he's really famous because of that. And nothing like this is happening anymore where DDoS tools are taking on large websites because websites eventually got smart about relocating their servers to places with larger bandwidths, uh, places where they can put redundant servers on different parts of the internet. So if one part of the backbone went down, they'd still be up because everything would reroute someplace else. So I think that's why IRC DDoS tools don't get as much play today as they did back then but they're much more widespread, and they take down a lot more machines than they used to. <laughs> so um, these were hard to use. They generally ran on Unix, and you'd generally have to break into a machine and then manually put this on there. Now that all is automated. Um, it's harder to track back to the attacker because you had that middle zombie layer. Um, there are also much more contention over machines that were infected with these things because they were harder to break in. They become more valuable, therefore. And then they started being password protected. And people would steal each other's zombies and so on. Um, <laughs> this is a brief history of IRC. So parallel to the DOS stuff developing, there was all these IRC scripts that were developing, too, because um, you had a lot of people spending a lot of time on IRC. And then eventually they realized that there's stuff that they can't do, but they want something to do it. So then they started writing scripts. And one of the first famous scripts that's still in use today is Eggdrop Bot. So this was written in the early 90s. And um, you can still download it. Um, as far as I can tell, it's a really good bot. And this is what I would call a good IRC bot. There's like good and evil, and there's some that's in the middle. But this is generally benign. It can be used for evil, but um, it's, it's pretty good at, at doing what it's supposed to without t breaking anything. Um, this was first used to do things like when um, you are on IRC, and if everyone gets somehow kicked off the channel, the first person that comes back on has ops, which means they can control the channel. So 
you'd want this to stick around and watch for that and then sort of just do a predetermined set of simple tasks where it doesn't have to sleep. The important thing is that it's, it's always there on the, on the network. So uh, after a while, I think maybe two or three years later, they came out with a, a bounce, IRC bounce proxy. And this falls into the gray category. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. It's found on a lot of compromised machines, uh, generally because it is really useful for hackers. It lets you connect to it, and then it will forward your connection to an IRC server. And that helps you because if someone wants to attack you, they'll attack the bounce machine and not you. Also, you can uh, tell that to it, or you can join it on like port 80 or something like that. So then if you need to IRC from work and you have a firewall that will only let a couple ports out, you can go through this and get through your corporate firewall. So that's handy. Um, you can also password protect it so that a bunch of people can't get onto it um, because if some asshole gets on there and then pisses people off and they try to take that machine off the network, then your bounce machine is down. Um, but even if you don't care about the, about the machine, then I guess you don't, um, <laughs> you can't spell anonymous. Um, <laughs> ah, anyway, um, <laughs> if you don't care about the machine, you probably don't care, but most people have only one or two shell machines and they hold on to them really tightly. They don't want to get them in trouble. Um, and again, the worst thing it can do is uh, slow down your IRC connection if someone starts to connect it. It starts to attack your bounce server because they're not going to get you directly. Um, so here's where the two tools started coming together. I was going to have a fancy little graphic with like a Darwinian evolution timeline thing, and and um, but I was sleeping instead. So <laughs> this is like imagine if you will that like form put this into a big visual picture, where you start with IRC scripts, which were handy for things like minding channels and aliases for sending files. So you don't have to type out the whole entire command line. Then those turn into IRC bots. Well, those are the ones that keep the channel <laughs> off while you're away. Um, then what would happen is that net splits would happen. Uh, net splits are when two servers on the same IRC network would break off and some of the people go on one side and some of the people go on the other side of the net split. And what you can do is, this happened accidentally, and eventually people figured out that when they join back together, the first person to get back on gets ops again. So you want bots there to try and keep these accidental things from breaking who gets ops. Eventually, people started to intentionally cause net splits just so that they could ride the net split, get ops. So then bots became even more important then. They would, then it would be bot versus human. And eventually, there was one bot to the net, cause the net split, another bot to keep the net split from giving other an ops. So you had bot versus bot. Um, and then people just started to get really pissed off and pack sword people because <laughs> uh, they weren't very creative and they just wanted to flood them. So that was around in the mid-90s, which I have this theory is all about the same time when AOL came on the network, when Clinton was like, hey, let's give subsidies for people to work in the tech industry. Everyone get on the internet. And then like everyone got on the internet, and then there was a bunch of like mean, stupid people. And, <laughs> and then everyone got angry all of a sudden, um, and then people started DOSing themselves. Also, IRC bots used to be mostly Unix because they were like, I don't know, elite things to run or something. And now they're mostly Windows. So you've got a wide variety of stuff to run if you don't have an operating system that's a decent operating system. <laughs> um, and then it finally got to the point where people use the scripting and the DOS tools so they can automatically scan for, say, null passwords on uh, Microsoft Windows machines. They'll, they'll break in, or I mean, if it's a null password, it's not really much of a break in, and then copy their files over and to the compromised machine and install IRC bots, like Eggdrop or BNC. A lot of people have their own IRC servers installed on the victim machines because then you don't have to go through official IRC server channels and so on. So that's always handy if you're doing like where is trading and whatnot, if you have your own IRC server and you don't have to worry about ops getting on you about, like, don't do this legal stuff here. <laughs> so at the same time, 
Okay, so this is the other half of the parallel evolution thing. You have um, denial of service tools. These become common later than IRC. It's again when a lot of people start getting on the internet. Uh, they were existent probably before IRC, but it wasn't too sophisticated. It was mostly stuff that was accidental. Like you have uh, CS students that are doing the first programming projects and they accidentally do a you know, while one fork loop or something and they fork off a bunch of processes on the machine. It slows everything down, possibly crashes it. Oh, also known as a fork bomb. You also have um, network denial of service. Again, this started in the, at around the same time that AOL became popular. <laughs> And uh, Clinton said, hey, everyone, get on the internet. And you started with your simple network flood, where it was a matter of who has the bigger bandwidth, your amplified network flood of getting smart about using less bandwidth to cause more damage. And then you figure out how to exploit weaknesses on the machine itself in order to bring it down instead of it being a brute force sort of thing. And that's where you get like sim floods and so on. Um, then eventually, people want to cause even more damage with less resources. That's where you get into distributed denial of service, where you send out one command and then a bunch of people do the work for you. Um, so then Trino and Stockeldracht uh, were released and they each had their own features in terms of security and what kind of floods they can do and things like that. Um, David Dietrich has done a really good job writing white papers on this stuff. So if you look up his papers, he's at University of Washington. He just goes into unbelievable minute technical detail about how the things work. And um, around that time, though, breaking in and downloading was done manually a lot. Uh, eventually, when IRC and, and denial of service came together, is when people realized they can I use IRC, which is a network they're already using, which is really widespread, to control their zombie machines <laughs> instead of having to set up separate networks all by themselves. So today's modern network killing robot which doesn't really kill a lot of networks, just like the smaller ones. <laughs> so it's sort of a misnomer. But they control everything in one package. You can get, it's sort of like a one-stop shopping sort of thing, where you get your tool to scan, break in, and copy your IRC bot onto the machine. And it doesn't really take a lot of effort. It's mostly a matter of scanning every single IP address that you can scan. And then you, statistically, you're going to have a certain amount of vulnerable machines. So we have a lot of users that say, why would a hacker want to break into my machine? I haven't done anything. And we explain to them there's nothing to do about you. You have an IP address. And it's just sort of like blind machination of, of scanning and breaking in. So everyone's vulnerable. And don't be too paranoid and, and all that stuff. Um, sometimes they listen to us. Most of the time they don't, which is why they have <sighs> their machines broken into. And then that's where uh, we come in at the university. So. Part of the great thing about the IRC bots is now you have a large amount of machines that can uh, attack. And you're getting new ones all the time. So you can get a really nice distributed denial of service network set up without having to do a lot of effort, or not as much as you did in the past. So these networks of, dis of denial of service machines are called DOS nets nowadays. <laughs> this is really hard to see. Um, let's see. I can guess what slide I'm on. Right. I can't really see that either. Um, I'll just summarize what's on this slide. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking, like, um, immigrant child labor became really expensive. <laughs> so you didn't want to hire you know, these, like, poor Indian children to break into machines anymore. So people started automating distributed knowledge service by using robots. Um, this <laughs> they're harder to filter because they come from all over, just because the IRC is everywhere. And they may or may not use spoofed source addresses, where they pretend that they're someone else, uh, because Botnet nodes are really cheap to get new ones. Plus, there's a lot of people that do egress filtering, not on the main backbones, but individual networks. So you don't need to fake your address. And sometimes you will not be successful if you do, because you won't be able to attack other people because of egress filtering. So um, these are also really widespread, because the media doesn't 
call any attention to them. A lot of people don't know about them, even people in the security industry. They don't know about DOS nets. They don't know about like robots that sit on IRC and so on. Um, also, they hide in legitimate IRC traffic. There's no special ports used, so it's kind of hard to find them. You can use things like Snort, but they're fully modifiable, so you can change the commands to something that aren't standard, and then Snort won't be able to find it unless you write your own signatures, and, well, then that's impossible to figure out all the possible variations in which they can change things. Those are so easily scriptable. Um, so the way these things avoid detection is they hide in channels that people can't see. Either the channels are hidden, or it looks like the channel's empty. There's weird characters in the channel name that aren't printable, things like that. Um, also, they're much more flexible than other distributed denial of service drones, just because you can upgrade them to do run any sort of attack that you want after they've been installed. And because it's um, MIRC scripting, you can just plug in whatever attack you want. <sighs> so then the obvious question to us as university security people, how are people getting infected with this stuff? And it's most of the time through the come and get it method. It's not so much people clicking on email attachments and things like that. This is really stereotypical user, dumb user behavior, but that's not usually the way these things are infected. You start with something, um, if they're on IRC, that's probably the easiest way to get them to download stuff because you message them something saying, hey, there's hot pictures of Jennifer Lopez at this website, or here's an American, screen, screen, American flag screensaver, <laughs> download this, and you'll get an American flag screensaver, American flag like pointers or whatever. And it's really, really small, the file that you download. It can be like 10 or 20K, and it's, it's not really, uh, and, and you can name it anything, pretty much. And a lot of people don't pay attention. They'll see like MP3 in the title. We'll just assume it's an MP3. Um, a lot of, also there's a lot of machines with blank admin passwords, especially with Windows XP, because you can't find the stupid admin account when you try to look in a control panel of users. You have to, um, do a bunch of other stuff that's not too obvious. The, the average home user isn't going to do to reset their admin password. So there's a lot of machines with bad passwords, blank passwords. Also another popular trick is to scan for something like Sub7. Sub7 was a Trojan that came out like, I don't know, five or six years ago, a really long time ago. And if you have any kind of virus protection at all, you'll be able to find it. So the, plan, the theory is that if someone's infected with sub-7, they don't care about their computer security at all. <laughs> so they're free to infect with whatever, with whatever you want to because they're not going to notice it. They're pretty oblivious to what's going on with their machine. And that, goes, that leads into evil bot, which was a, an, an evil robot like Eggdrop was good. This is sort of the you know, evil IRC bot example. And this is a backdoor Windows Trojan and it adds itself to the registry to start at boot time. Pretty much all bots do that. It's to make sure that they're always running. And it puts up a backdoor. If you nmap a lot of these machines, you'll see weird ports open. You'll tell that to them. Sometimes you'll get something useful in terms of what it is. Sometimes you won't. But a lot of weird ports open is one way that we use to determine if something's been broken into. Oh, and then GTBot. This is the big IRC denial of service bot that everyone uses. It's the most popular one. There's a bunch of different variants. It's pretty much GT bot and, and SD bot. This came out relatively recently, three years ago. And it's Windows based. It's basically an MRC, MIRC client. And it runs MIRC. It has a bunch of MIRC.ini bot scripts. And it runs in stealth mode using the hide window program. So as soon as you install it, it hides the window. It doesn't show up in task manager doesn't show up in anything that you'd normally use to look at processes. And there's this can be downloaded by people who think it, it, it's just an MIRC client, because it is an MIRC client, but it has a bunch of things in the INI file that uh, make it responsive to people issuing it certain commands. And all that stuff is scripted in the MIRC INI file. This also supports plugins, so you can have it um, Download, you can download whatever you want. If you want a BGP attack, you just tell it to upgrade, go to a web certain website to download something, and then you'll have a new plugin for BGP attacks. Um, so this is what it looks like. 
when you go onto the channel that in which GT bot is AGT bot or more of them is on, you as an operator you can you can set who can issue commands on these bots based on your nickname and what host name you're coming from to make sure that not just anyone can issue commands if they stumble onto your IRC channel with your bot stash on them. And these are much easier to use than Trino and Stockeldraft and so on because if you get it wrong, the syntax wrong, it'll give you a nice little usage thing saying, no, this is how you, you know, this is how you run this command, this is how you run that command. So it's again a lot more user friendly than the other stuff, which is pretty much you had to know what you're doing and and uh, not get much feedback. Um, so these are more commands that um, <clears throat> these things can do. They can flood channels for you. They can do port scans of different machines for you. And they can um, get an update from a web page. And if, you're, if the address you give it matches a pre-selected I, a URL that was in the configuration file, then you can update things that way. Um, these are a bunch of registry key settings that get set. These are, if you look for these registry key settings on your computer, they are probably a pretty good, uh, I, probably a pretty good indication that you've been infected. But this stuff is um, pretty much available online anywhere. Um, if you want to look that up later. So the other question is, how do you remove GTBot once it's on your machine? Because if it has a hidden window and you can't see it in Process Manager and so on. So generally what we find at the university is if you have something like this installed on your machine, you're probably going to have a lot of other problems with your machine. <laughs> There's probably other backdoors on there you don't know about. You're not going to be able to get rid of all of them yourself. So it's probably a good idea to reformat and reinstall. That's what we end up telling our users to do. Um, if, all, if you are going to trust on blind faith that you don't have anything else wrong with your computer, you can run a virus scanner and that will catch well-known uh, variants of GDBot and SDBot and so on. You can also download this um, tool from S Lockdown Corp. It basically does the same thing as a virus scanner. Um, and there's a free version and a paid version. And uh, I'll have the URL at, for that at the end. Also, then after you get rid of it, you should you should at least delete the registry key that, well, actually, if you're running a, a virus scanner, it's going to get rid of the registry key for you, probably. But you can manually delete the registry key <coughs> that it creates to make it start up again after every boot. But like all things, when you're modifying something important, you should make a backup first. And you can leave the MIRC keys there, because they don't really uh, affect system operation that much. Oh, and the non-recommended way of getting rid of these is to do it manually. There's some of these bots that have triggers that when they sense they're being killed, or de uh, they will delete things. Uh, they could format your hard drive and so on and so forth. So that's another bad reason for you to try and do it yourself, and more reason that you should just reformat and reinstall once you find something like this on your machine. So if you want to uh, get rid of GTBot, since it's just an MIRC, a client with a bunch of INI files that have been specialized. If you look for MIRC INI files on your system, and there's more of them than there should be. So if you don't run IRC, MIRC and there's one on there, then you, it's a good I, in, indication that you're infected. If you only have one copy installed and there's like three or four, is another good indication that you've been infected. Because you should only have one MIRC INI file for each version of MIRC, so um, that's pretty easy to figure out. Um, um, um. Also, some of these bots are modified, so you, you can script, change the scripting in pretty much any aspect of this stuff. So you can have it run off of stuff that isn't MIRC INI at all, it can be some other file. Um. Also, yeah, so you can kill the process and delete the files, hope that nothing bad happens in terms of trojaning. You should probably be sure the process is stopped running before you delete anything, but it's kind of hard to do if. Uh, you can't see the process. Um, but if you have another tool that gives a more comprehensive process list, you could do it that way. 
If one accidentally opens on your desktop, don't type anything into it, because some people have tried that. They're like, oh, I'm running an IRC, and they start typing things in the window, and then Trojans get set off, and then stuff gets deleted, and so on. Um, and then the other big bot, other than GTBot, is SDBot. And that's more or less the same. It has slightly different uh, features, slightly different command line stuff. Um, it's more or less the same thing, just a different variant. Does pretty much all the same things as GTBot. It can also be removed by using something like McAfee or another antivirus program. And so this is where I'm going to do a demonstration of bots. So I'm going to get out of VMware, or a different VMware thing. So what I have here is I have VMware with a Linux um, Linux IRC server. Okay. Cool. Is that big enough for people to see? <laughs> so in this example, I have um, I'm Vicky, so I'm the the purple user there, and uh, so this window down here is a TCP dump running, so you can see where things are going back and forth. Uh, 135 is the IRC server. Um, 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 136 is one of the infected botnet machines I have. And as you can see, I was running some port scans of another victim machine. And you can see that the first time the port scan is run, so these tools aren't particularly reliable. So you see, it, the first time it finds no open ports, and then the second time running it like a minute later, it finds some open ports. Um, you can run uh, like things like the info command, and then all the bots on the network will respond and say, um, "I'm coming. I'm coming from this operating system. I've transferred this many files. This is how long I've been up. Uh, this is the current time where I am." So this is a machine that's already infected. As you can see, there's nothing here to see in terms of, ah. In terms of task manager, nothing will be showing up. Um, so you know, there's nothing in the task manager. But this is something that's actually running a bot, and this is the uh, if you get a GT bot, you can download pretty much anywhere. This is what it will look like. In um, terms of files, you have um, gates, which is the number of, is the gateways that it has, that it's, or servers that it should be checking. Which is a really, really, really long list of servers. I assume that if some of them go down, then you can just go to other ones. And then these are the MIRC INI files. If you <coughs> take a look at these, it starts out with some pretty basic stuff, like um, what my username is and things like that. And then it goes off into this, into the scripting. So here you can see it's scripting different commands. Like here's a port redirect command. So you'd issue pound port redirect, and then it would run this little script here. Do port redirection. And there's so many aliases here that spread across a couple different files. So you see, it's, it's got a lot of features and a lot of different commands that it can run. So you have like um, your flooding commands and, and so on and so forth. And this is what it looks like when something's being infected. So if you watch the task manager really closely, you can see it popping up when GTBot gets started, and then it will go away first, like as soon as it comes up. You see, it's like there, and then because VMware is slow, it's <laughs> and now it's gone. And that's all that you see. You're probably not going to catch that. Um, normally, if you look here on um, on uh, the TCP dump, it's catching a lot of traffic because this new machine is connecting to the IRC server. And this is uh, 249.137, and you can see 249. Well, 137 is still not on the IRC channel, apparently. So if you go back to Linux machine, you can see 
uh, Gera 5, which is that new bot that I just started, has joined pound attempt, which was hard-coded into the INI file. And so now I have two bots. So now if I wanted to port scan another machine, you'll have two different bots port scanning at the same time. And again, the first bot has found no ports. So I'd probably, there's problems with uh, timing out and, and so on, but um, yeah, so this is really useful if you want to port scan things and you don't want to be have it traced back to you. So here you can find you run it again, and now they've found a um, Microsoft name service things on there. So I think that should do it for demonstration. Oh, and this is also kind of neat. When um, you have your hide window program that comes with it. Um, I think it's this one. Yeah, that's not it. Um, so hide window will hide windows, but also show you a list of hidden windows. So this one's the GT bot, just because it has no like name or anything there. So you can show it, and you can see this little thing popped up here. And that's what it looks like when, you, when it's shown. So again, it's, it's pretty invisible. the talk. So if you've got um, robots beating up random people on your campus, <laughs> that's one way to detect a botnet on your network. Um, otherwise, if you want to get rid of these things, since they're so well hiding themselves, you're pretty much left with the options of looking at a virus scanner, looking at flows, which are router information sort of things. Uh, if you have access to Cisco routers, you can have it spit out flows and it gives connection reports of to and from addresses, to and from ports, um, how many bytes were transferred, so on and so forth. So it's really handy if you're a, a net admin sort of person. And what you want to look for in your flows, you want to look for timing. You want to look for a machine being compromised and then immediately starting to scan out. So there's some really obvious things that you can look for like um, scanning port 445, which is you know, trying blank passwords. If there's connection on that port and then really start scanning out, you know, you've probably got an infected machine on your hands. You can use an intrusion detection system like Snort that'll catch things that haven't been heavily modified. You can also subscribe to a mailing list like First or NSP. First is a, it's a coalition of like groups that have been together since 85 or so, and you have to get membership and, and so on. I think they're at first.org, but I'm not positive. Um, NSP is like network service providers list. That's another thing where you have to get membership for. So that's pretty much only available to people that run large ISPs or university networks and stuff like that. Um, and, but these mailing lists are good because you have people who are on, IR, on ISPs. They're watching their traffic. They can see botnets pop up, and then they'll tell you, hey, uh, everyone on the list, there's a botnet on you know, this IP address and this IP address, and this is the server that they're using, and gets people's attention, and then you can take down the botnets from the source by taking down the IRC server. You can also use something like Packeteer. This is another option if you run a really large network, because you can get a um, Packeteer, which uh, is supposed to ban rate limit things like Kazaa and other uh, file sharing programs. So if, it will also it'll give you a nice list of people that have been using the most bandwidth on the network. And there's a good chance that <coughs> those people are not doing it intentionally. They're doing it unknowingly because they've been infected. So that's a, another good place to look. Also, lo machines with lots of IRC traffic and ICMP traffic because they're flooding someone else, they're attacking someone else. That's only a good sign for when they're actually attacking. And also, if you're on IRC a lot, you sometimes see bots joining channels because they have formulaic nicknames, like they've like Joe 71. You kick them off and they come back like Joe 72. Sometimes it's just an obnoxious person, but sometimes it's also a, a bot. And here's URLs. If you want to download some of this stuff and play with it yourself, there's a lot of different things at the web link source link. You can get SDBot, GTBot, like Winterbot, and, and so on. You can download it onto your machine and infect yourself and see what you can do and <laughs> infect other people. 
<coughs> and the first URL there, Lockdown Corp, is where you get that like fancy little thing that's just supposed to get bots and nothing else. And also you can download Eggdrop and BNC, play with those and so on. So yeah, so that's the end of the talk. Are there any questions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. I think smaller networks are ones that haven't been massively uh, parallelized. Like they, they, they don't. A lot of people, like CNN, will uh, use Akamai because Akamai is like really giant pipes, and they're also physically diverse networks. So, and if you're not paying out a lot of money to get super redundant network bandwidth stuff, then you're vulnerable to this sort of thing taking you down. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the question was, uh, does the bot show up in the process list? So here you can see the process list. I don't see anything here. I mean, no, oh, but I guess the question is no, <laughs> that it doesn't show up there either. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it, because here, um, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, bots just signed off. <laughs> so. uh, well, the question is, how often were these hidden with a r Windows rootkit, or installed automatically with a Windows rootkit? How often do you what? Um, generally, uh, I don't see anything. Most of the time, they aren't sophisticated enough to hide it on a kernel level. It's just a hide window sort of thing because that's a lot easier to roll out. But it's a pretty common thing with rootkits. Like, I don't know. I'd, if I had to guess, I would say like 80% of the time or something, depending on what you want your rootkit to do. But yeah, it's pretty common. Yeah, so the question is, is there anything new after GTBot and SDBot? And there are things, but they're still given credit as being derivatives of GTBot because they still use the core and they've still got some, they've got new features, but there hasn't been anything that's been different enough from the past to label itself a new category. Is that it? Okay. All right, well, thanks for coming to my talk.